languages, <laughs> it's changed names now, it used to be called Mela. She wrote her dissertation on Armenian bookbinding. She is the only specialist writing on Armenian books and manuscripts in this continent. We have two art historians, one of them at Tufts, Christina Maranchi, and the other is Sylvie Marion at the Morgan Library. She has published a lot on bookbinding, silverwork, manuscript illumination, but lately she's been very busy. She's uh, doing entries for the catalog at the Met. Christina and I have also participated in that catalog. The Metropolitan Museum is going to have its first show on Armenian culture. It's opening on September 18th, and I hope you can all get to see it. It's the first big Metropolitan Museum. So tonight, and I will repeat this because half the audience comes late. Tonight, I dedicate tonight's commemoration to Sylvie's great-grandfather, Hagel Babikia, a lawyer and a member of parliament of the Ottoman Empire. When the Adana massacres occurred in April 1909, he was sent along with a Turkish colleague, Yusuf Kemal Bey, to investigate the massacres. He returned and wrote a report on his findings, which he was to present to Parliament. He died in mysterious circumstances and was killed before he could present his report. I will repeat this dedication again before the moment of silence that we always have at the end of this lecture. And now I'm delighted to give this pulpit to my friend, Sylvia. First, can everybody hear me? I want to be nice and loud so nobody sleeps, okay? So thank you, Ina, for that very kind and interesting introduction and also for dedicating this to my great-grandfather. I'm really very, very honored to have been invited to speak this year at the Genocide Commemoration Lecture, and I would like to express my gratitude to all the sponsors who made this possible, First, of course, to Ina Bagdans McCabe, the holder of the Darakjan Jafarian Chair in Armenian History, the Executive Administrative Dean of Tufts University, the History Department at Tufts, the Armenian Club at Tufts, and the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, also known as Nasser. I would also like to express my appreciation to the Houghton Library of Harvard University for awarding me the Catherine F. Panzer, Jr. Fellowship in Descriptive Bibliography in 2008 to 2009, which enabled me to spend over a month researching Armenian manuscripts at the Houghton and led me on this particular manuscript journey. I also want to thank the wonderful staff at the Houghton Library, who is always unfailingly helpful. And I especially want to thank Nancy Keeler, and her late sister, Esther Safarian, for sharing their family history and the amazing journey of one of the manuscripts I'm going to speak about this evening. Nancy and some members of her extended family are here tonight, and I'm really happy to welcome them. I'm really happy you're here. Okay. Manuscripts tell stories. By this, I don't just mean the textual content of the book, what is written in them, but the objects themselves, have a lot to tell us if we know how to ask the right questions and then listen to what they have to say. Some stories require a bit of detective work to uncover, and tonight I hope to tell you some of what I have discovered through my investigations. These manuscripts will in many ways reflect the history of the people that produced them, and as we shall see, these artifacts also function as symbols of those people. Now I want to start with a brief introduction about what a manuscript is, since not everyone here will be familiar with some of the terms I will be using. And I also want to give you some sense of who the people were who produced these wonderful objects. I wonder if we could have the lights down a little bit so we'll see the slides better. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah. My fault. <laughs> I forgot. <Okay. laughs> 
So first of all, a manuscript is a handwritten book produced without the use of a printing press. Each word was written by hand with a quill or reed pen and ink by a highly trained scribe and decorated by a skilled artist. In the Armenian tradition, most scribes and artists were priests, but not all. We even have a few female scribes and artists, but very few. In this example, we have a 14th century selfie of the scribe and artist Serun, who is one of my favorite manuscript illuminators. He was from the Lake Van area, and we see him here working at a kind of a hanging easel, which seems to be something typical of the Lake of Lake Van. We know his name because he tells us. He has written at the top of his self-portrait, this is Tzedem, the artist. He's an example of a lay artist and scribe, not a priest, otherwise he would have definitely informed us of that fact. This manuscript was copied on paper, a writing material made from pulp formed from macerated rags. I want to briefly explain the difference between paper and parchment, because many people think it's the same thing because it will be important to know this later on. Parchment is another type of writing material. They, they can make manuscripts out of parchment, but it's made from specially prepared animal skin. It's therefore more expensive and rather strong. It's stronger than paper. However, because it's made from animal skin, it is much more sensitive to changes in temperature and humidity than paper is. This is just another example of a 17th century manuscript that I'll talk about a little bit. So Armenian manuscripts almost always include something called a colophon, or in Armenian, hishadagaran. This is an inscription usually written at the end of the manuscript by the scribe. Sometimes also the artist will add his own, and later owners will also add their own colophons. But the initial manuscript will inform us excuse me, the initial colophon will inform us where and when it was completed, the names of everyone who helped produce it, the sponsor or person who commissioned and paid for the work, and lots of historical information, including who ruled over that region, the current church hierarchy, battles and wars fought, earthquakes or eclipses which may have occurred, etc. And in Armenian history, there are many periods of time we don't have documents um, you know, in archives about what happened in their world, we have colophons. So historians have to use the colophons to get the information. The scribe will also provide detailed information <clears throat> about his family, usually including everybody's names, enabling us to construct family trees and pinpoint exactly who he was. And he will ask future readers to pray for everyone mentioned. However, in his colophon, the scribe must remain extremely modest, denigrating himself by writing something like, please remember me, O readers of this gospel book, the miserable, vile, and untalented scribe Hagop, and pray for my soul, even though I do not deserve your heavenward prayers, because I am so despicable, worthless, and sinful. And pray for my family members, and he will name everybody, etc., etc. Now, however, although he will insult himself, he will effusively praise the sponsor of the manuscript for the pious deed of having commissioned this sacred work. Now, Armenian colophons can go on for pages and pages, and as you can see here in this example of a manuscript with a 14-page colophon. Western European manuscripts, on the other hand, usually have little or no information on who, when, or where they were produced. You're lucky to get a sentence, something to the effect of, this was painted by Joe. Okay, so now let's get to the manuscripts I want to discuss tonight. On April 10th, 2009, and remember this date because I'm going to have something interesting to say about it later. So on April 10th, 2009, after a few weeks of examining Armenian manuscripts at the Houghton Library, I requested to see the next one on my list. Manuscript Armenian 12, a Heismavur or Synaxaranan, which is a book of commemoration of saints in date order. The date it was made, the year it was made, is not yet clear. Within the text, I found a short colophon dated 1418, 
but the illustrations are definitely mid-17th century. So it could be a manuscript copied in 1418, but not decorated until the 17th century. Or perhaps it's a 17th century scribe copied the older colophon from his exemplar. In any case, it's either 15th or 17th century. This manuscript was copied on parchment and came in a huge protective box, which was very heavy. I opened the box, and this is what I saw. A very damaged manuscript, the covers gone, the leaves at the beginning and end of the manuscript were missing, and for the first couple of extant leaves, and the first couple of extant leaves were detached, as you see on the left. Since the end of the manuscript is missing, the final colophon is missing, and this is why we don't have more detailed information about the date and place it was produced. There had been water damage, as you can see from the leaves which are cockled on the foredge here. All this, and you see the stains here too. Since this manuscript was made from parchment, it was particularly vulnerable to damage from water. But such things can happen. For example, the roof of a church or a home might have leaked. So I wasn't yet too alarmed at its bad condition. Here you see how thick this manuscript is. It's six inches thick at the spine. And you can see I photographed it with a pencil to get an idea of its proportions here. You can also see the results from the water damage all along the edges of the volume. This is at the head of the manuscript. Okay, this is where the water hit it. The covers are gone. And even so, it was very heavy, even without covers. Then I opened the book, and I noticed these slits, which I found rather strange. I had never seen anything like this before, and I didn't understand what they were, but I was getting curious. What were these slits from? I hope you can see them in the back here, here, short slits. As I started carefully going through the manuscript, I started to find more and more slashes that were becoming longer as I went through the book. And I slowly realized that something horrible had happened to this manuscript. It clearly had been viciously attacked. Here are more slits, slashes. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, parchment is very strong. It's not something you can make deep cuts in with a little butter knife or embroidery scissors, for example. This manuscript had been violently hacked with either a sword or an ax and using a lot of force. Like, and it started in the middle of the book, meaning that the book was open when it was attacked. The slashes go through a total of 46 folios of parchment, that is, 46 sheets. I was starting to get very upset. It was extremely disturbing to look at this, and I began to feel like I was disrespectfully staring at a mutilated body. I also found this page with stains, which looked to me like possible blood stains although perhaps that was just my imagination running wild. We don't really know if this is blood or not. I mean, it could be tested, but that hasn't been done. By now, I was extremely disturbed, and I realized there was an important story behind this manuscript. I wanted to find out what happened to it and who had donated it to the library, as it was unlikely that a library would buy a manuscript in such a deplorable condition. I hoped that the donors would have told the library something about its history. So I went to speak to the librarian on duty, who told me that they had no other information in their files about it. He went and checked. But he directed me to the accession book. And this is what I found. Oh, come on. I put new batteries in here. <laughs> there we go. The manuscript was donated in 1965 by these four people. I knew immediately that they were all related, even though they had four different family names. But since the donation had been made almost 45 years earlier, I was getting, I was a little worried, because if these people were elderly, 
I didn't, none of them would still be alive. So I wondered if anybody would still be around. I noticed that one person used to live in Winchester, Mrs. Ralph Safarian. It's not far from Cambridge where I was at Harvard. But she was using her husband's name, and I started my internet search, because I didn't have her name, with the name Ralph Safarian. So I did find someone with that name, but I realized from the context that he would only be in his 40s in 2009. So young Ralph certainly couldn't have been married in 1965. And I figured he must be this man's son. Then, continued searching, I found something sad, which was the obituary of Ralph Safarian Sr. And I noticed that the date of the obituary was April 10, 1999. If you remember, I was at the library looking at this manuscript on April 10, 2009. The obituary had been published exactly 10 years before to the day. I got a little freaked out by this. But finally, I took it as a sign. I was going to find these people. And I did. Through the obituary, I got the names of his family members, including his wife's name, Esther, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. I found her phone number, called her out of the blue, introduced myself, and asked if it was her family that had donated the manuscript to the Houghton Library. She was, of course, surprised by this call, but she was just wonderful, and confirmed that it was indeed her family, the Bobosian family. I had found one of the donors. And then she connected me with her sister, who was also on the list, Nancy Bobosian Keeler who now happened to live in Cambridge. So a week later, the three of us met for lunch, and that's how I got the story behind the manuscript. <clears throat> and our story begins in Harput, also called Harput with various spellings, and it has a new Turkish name now. Um, in Harput and the Ottoman Empire. So sometimes I'll say Harpert and sometimes I'll say Harpert. So I'm talking about the same place. The Borosian family was from Harpert, a thriving town in a province by the same name, with a large Armenian population in the late 19th century. It was also a region in which American Protestant missionaries from the ABCFM had been stationed. Now, ABCFM stands for the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. These missionaries were sent throughout the world and those who originally went to Turkey in the early to mid-19th century were sent to try and convert Muslims to Christianity. But the Muslims were not very receptive to this. They then turned their efforts to Armenians with whom they had more success. This is why you see Armenian Protestant churches in the US. Many congregants are descendants of families who were converted in the 19th or early 20th century. The missionaries had also opened many schools, including schools for girls, which was something new, theological seminaries, hospitals, and Protestant Armenian churches in the Ottoman Empire. They opened the famed Euphrates College in Harpet. Many missionaries were witnesses to both the Hamidian massacres of 1894-5 to 96, as well as to the Armenian genocide of 1915 and they saved thousands of Armenian lives. Their written testimonies also provide vital evidence for these pogroms. By the last quarter of the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire was in a state of decline and in a period of great unrest. Armenians had been urging for decades for civil reforms to be enacted to improve their situation as second-class citizens in the empire. They were somewhat backed by European powers. Not too much. The reigning Sultan, Abdul Hamid II, nominally approved certain reforms, but they were never truly and fully implemented. A number of attacks on Armenian Christian villages occurred in the interior, some starting in 1894. And by the fall of 1895, a series of pogroms were carried out with the complicity of the central government mostly in the Armenian provinces. They were predominantly led by armed groups of Kurdish brigands called the Hamidiye, who had been given semi-official status by the government, along with uniforms, arms, and money, and who were, shall we say, encouraged by the central government 
to attack unarmed Armenian villages and towns. In many cases, soldiers either stood by doing nothing or actually participated in the ensuing violence um, along with the Hamidiyya. This included torture, rape, murder, looting, and wholesale destruction, including the burning of churches and entire villages, and even the burning of people who had taken refuge inside churches. These pogroms, now called the Hamidian massacres after the Sultan, were supposed to be restricted to the Armenian population. But in some areas, no distinction was made between Armenian Christians, Greek Christians, and Assyrian Christians, who were sometimes murdered alongside the Armenians. They'll take anybody's loot. On November 11th, a bugle call signaled the beginning of the massacres in the town of Harpert. The number of people killed is unclear. I have not done thorough research on this, but so far the figures I have found range from 500 to 1,900. And these figures do not count later deaths from disease, wounds, hunger, or cold. One statistic states that the province of Harpert and its 59 villages had almost 7,500 casualties. This, this is an old um, statistic from a book from the 19th century. The city itself was burned, plundered, despoiled, and we know that minimally hundreds of people were brutally murdered the first few days. And not only were people viciously killed, but their cultural heritage also became part of the destruction. It was not uncommon to brutalize and desecrate sacred objects such as holy books as they were symbolic of the despised quote-unquote enemy. We have various testimony from witnesses who describe this phenomenon, including a written one from an unnamed Muslim published in a book in 1896 titled Turkey and the Armenian Atrocities by Reverend Edwin M. Bliss. The Muslim is unnamed for, in his book for obvious reasons. This long testimony includes the following, and I quote, well, this is an English translation, but. So they, and by that he means the Kurdish and Turkish mobs, they plundered churches and monasteries and they took all the property of the common people, their flocks and herds, their ornaments and their money, their house furnishings, their food, and even the clothing of the men and women in their flight. He continues describing the burning of homes, schools, and churches. And since the stone churches would not burn, they ruined them in other ways, and quote, their sacred books were torn in pieces and cast on dung hills, end quote. As I mentioned earlier, the Bogosian family was from Harpert. We don't have the details about exactly what the family experienced experienced during the November 1895 massacres there, but clearly some survived, as their descendants are here in the U.S., as well as descendants of two sisters who survived the 1915 genocide and came to the U.S. afterwards, after the war. Their family history relates the following. At some point after the 1895 massacre, this damaged manuscript was found in or near Harpert in a gutter explaining the severe water damage I showed you. The covers were gone, and it is certainly possible that it had been decorated with silver covers that had been hacked off to be sold. The person who found it brought it to Mr. Voskan Bogosian, the family patriarch, who bought it from him. Voskan sent the manuscript to his son Sarkis, who was in Constantinople. Sarkis took it to Leipzig, Germany, and showed it to some scholars there. In 1903, Sarkis immigrated to the United States and brought the large, heavy manuscript with him. In 1904, his younger bro brother, Paul Bogosian, came to the United States, arriving first to Patterson, New Jersey. He was around 15 years old. In 1915, after hearing about the mass killings and deportations of what has come to be known as the Armenian Genocide, Sarkis returned to Harper to help his family. He never returned. It's presumed he was killed. The manuscript was then passed down in the family. In the 1960s, Paul Borosian, 
who by now was the father of Esther, Nancy, and son Paul Jr., was looking to restore the damages undergone by the manuscript and was thinking about what depository or collection he should give it to after his death. The local newspaper published this article about him and the manuscript, explaining that the damage was so extensive that he couldn't find anyone willing or able to repair it. But in the end, in my opinion, that was a good thing. Had it been restored, we would have lost most of the evidence of its traumatic history, and I probably wouldn't be telling you this story today. After his death a few months later, in 1962, his descendants, that is his three children and his sister, those are the four names on that list, they decided to donate it to the Houghton Library at Harvard University, where it resides today. Oops, not yet. Armenians were not the only ones to suffer during the Hamidian massacres, however. I mentioned earlier that the massacres were supposed to be restricted to Armenians, but other Christians were also victims in some villages, such as the Assyrian Christians. They and their possessions were also violently attacked. And I have an example to show you with another story behind it. This is another remarkable manuscript at the Houghton Library that I studied during a previous research trip there. This is an 11th or 12th century Syriac Christian lectionary, which is a collection of scripture readings for a given day. Also stored in a protective box, upon opening it, you are immediately presented with this huge, rather shocking crater, about seven and a half by 11 inches wide and one and a half inches deep. The manuscript is made of parchment, that is animal skin. There are no covers. And as you can see, it is extremely damaged and in quite fragile condition. Again, the first question one asks upon seeing this is, what happened to this manuscript? And then the other questions come, why, when, where, and how? Now this is just the top view of the manuscript and I'll show you the extent of the damage as we continue. Because of the fragility of the manuscript, it was very difficult to examine and turn pages. This is a side view of the crater and upon carefully Carefully opening a section of it, I could see other damage caused by vandalism. I just opened kind of a chunk, as you see. Someone, at some point, had cut out many of the designs or medallions in the manuscript. This could have happened long before 1895. This is damage visible in the middle of the manuscript, and you can see where someone had tried to repair the torn sections. I was helped here by the book conservator, Mary Owey, formerly in the conservation department at the Houghton. There are also some burnt areas in the manuscript indicated that it certainly had been in contact with fire, but I still couldn't understand how that huge crater was formed. Then I noticed a small hole at the back of the manuscript which formed the bottom of the crater seen on the front. And it occurred to me that this was probably the entrance hole of a bullet. The bullet, upon exiting, would have formed the large crater. So it goes in small hole and kind of explodes and opens up. The bullet, upon exiting, would have formed the large crater. I showed photographs of this manuscript to a colleague who is knowledgeable about forensics and guns, and he agreed that it certainly could have been formed by a bullet. This is what I believe are the entrance and exit holes of a bullet that was shot into this manuscript, and it also suffered from fire. We can only imagine the horrendous incident that led to this book being shot and burned. It's a visible sign of what the people associated with it must also have suffered. There was no information on specifically where and exactly when this happened except for the following. Inside the box was this note informing us that this Syriac manuscript 
had been brutalized by burning at the time of the Armenian massacres of 1895 to 96. It was almost unbelievable that this one repository, the Houghton Library, had two examples of manuscripts that had both been attacked during the same pogroms. So the next question was, how did it end up at Harvard? And again, a little digging yielded some results. The records indicate that the manuscript was sold to the Semitic Museum at Harvard University in 1900 by Reverend James L. Barton, whose photograph you see here. Reverend Barton, a native New Englander, was a missionary for the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, and along with his wife, Flora, had been stationed in Harput from 1885 to 1894. He and his wife left in 1894 because of his wife's health problems, and, he returned, and they returned to the U.S. around that time, that is, before the massacre started in Harput. He continued working for the ABCFM as foreign secretary and in other capacities. After the Armenian Genocide, he became chairman of Near East Relief after it was chartered by Congress in 1919. So at first, I didn't understand. It was unclear how he could have acquired the manuscript that says it happened in the massacres of 1895 to 96, since he left Turkey in 1894. Well, it turns out that he had been entrusted with the manuscript later by a fellow missionary, Reverend Alfeos N. Andras, who was stationed in Mardin, and who in turn was acting for a native seller. So here is Mardin. We already talked about Harpeck, and we will talk about Denzor later. Reverend Andrus was a missionary of the ABCFM, stationed in Mardin from 1868 to 1916, and was a witness to the massacres of 1895 to 96 as well as to the genocide of 1915. He was forcibly removed from Mardin to, Siva, to Sivas by the Turkish government in 1916, and then he was sent to Constantinople until 1917, where he was advised by the US ambassador to go back to the United States. Mardin now was primarily a Syriac Christian town, although it also had an Armenian population. It was left mostly undisturbed during the 1895 massacres, reportedly because of a very powerful Kurdish family or tribe who was on good terms with the Armenian, excuse me, with the American missionaries. For their sake, this powerful family did not permish, permit the Kurdish mobs to attack Mardin. The mobs were expressly encouraged to attack Armenians and were theoretically not supposed to touch other Christians anyway. But in many villages with both Armenian and Assyrian Christians, the Assyrian population was also attacked and their possessions were looted or brutalized. Although Mardin was left relatively unscathed in 1895, and it would not be so lucky in 1915, Reverend Andrus had worked extensively in relief efforts for the survivors of, may of many neighboring towns that were burned, looted, and destroyed. It is not known precisely from where, what town he got this manuscript, or exactly what happened to it, but it is certainly from a nearby victimized town or village. So the manuscript was bought by the Semitic Museum in 1900, and in 1959 or 1960, the Syriac manuscripts at the Semitic Museum were transferred to the Houghton Library. And by the way, this manuscript will be on display at the Houghton for an upcoming exhibition called Passports, Lives in Transit, which begins April 30th until August 16th this year. So you can go see it in the flesh if you want to. This is Professor J. Randall Harris, a scholar of early Christian literature, specialist of Syriac manuscripts, curator of manuscripts, and a relief worker shortly after the Hamidian massacres. Harris made numerous trips in his life to the Near East in search of manuscripts to study and if possible, by. He and his wife, Helen, both devout Quakers, traveled to Turkey from Mardin to, um, from Mar uh, sorry, traveled to Turkey from March to November 1896, only some six to 12 months after many of these massacres. They wrote letters to their friends in England, which were later published, and the title of that book is here in yellow, their letters. 
and they wrote about the horrible situation after the massacres. They did fundraising through the, their friends by writing these letters to help in relief work for survivors. In June 1896, they reached Mardin, where they were the guests of Reverend Andrus and his wife. Professor Harris and Reverend Andrus spent some time together on a Syriac manuscript hunting exhibition, they called it, in the Mardin area, which is mentioned in the letters. The following is an interesting quote from one of Randall Harris's letters on the subject, and I quote, As to the results of this little expedition, well, they were a little disappointing. A great deal of damage had been done in some places by the Kurds, who have an especial spite against books, and love to show their antipathy to Christianity by destroying the Gospels. One monastery where we hoped to find interesting matter was completely ruined and all the books destroyed." End quote. It is clear that manuscripts, especially religious ones, were so closely associated with the ethnic or religious group of people who produced them that the books sometimes suffered the same fate as the human population did in times of tragic invasions, war, or ethnic persecution. The enemy would readily attack and destroy these, ina these inanimate objects, not only to desecrate them, but also because they represented their human rivals. that these horrible things only happened in the 19th century, here's another unfortunate example from almost 500 years earlier. This is an Armenian gospel book dated 1266, made for the Cilician Armenian king Hetun I by the famed artist and scribe Todos Roslin. This parchment manuscript, a royal commission, was a victim of the third invasion of Timur, also known as Tamerlane, which occurred around 1399. We don't know exactly where this gospel book was when it was attacked. However, a later colophon of 1401 gives us vital information about the damage it suffered and its subsequent extensive restoration. These are not the restored pages. We learn that it was restored by a well-known scribe and artist of the Lake Ron area, the priest Hovanes Hizansi, with the help of Asfadzadur Kahana, that is, Asfadzadur the priest. Now note this is not the same, you may have noticed on the previous slide, another Hovanes of Pizan. He's from the 17th century, this one is from the 15th. Um, a portion of the 1401 colophon tells us, Christ God, with the intercession of the holy evangelists, have mercy on Hovanes the priest, and his parents, and all his relatives, both living and deceased, as it is he, with fervent heart, who restored this holy gospel, this gospel in horrifying condition, which fell into the hands of foreigners who shredded it like a lamb delivered to wolves. He restored it so that this royal memorial shall not be annihilated. Hovanes was able to save 39 relatively undamaged folios of the original parchment manuscript, written in elegant Yakatagir script, or majuscule script. He repaired or replaced the rest. This slide shows two undamaged leaves from the original parchment manuscript of 1266. The restoration by Hovanes Kizansi consisted of saving as much of the original as possible and replacing or repairing damaged portions with newly written text on a more yellow paper. So paper and parchment mixed together, as you can see on the right. This is a partially saved sheet with a patch of new text on yellow paper replacing the damaged portion. If the pages were too damaged to save, he replaced them completely, but he salvaged whatever illuminations and marginal decorations that he could from the original and glued them onto the newly written sheet, as you see on the left. So here is the patch. This is a, a parchment decoration uh, image that was glued onto new text. And you can see the difference in the scripts, even if you don't read Armenian, of the newer yellow paper versus the parchment original. So this is Yekatagir script, the majuscule. This is Bolodir script, a later script. 
that Hovhannes used in his manuscripts. Unfortunately, these types of incidents occur all over the world and under all kinds of circumstances. This book is from the old library in Copenhagen, but at the time of the 1807 English bombardment of Copenhagen, when it sustained this damage, it was housed in the loft above a church called Trinity Church. Some grenades or bombs went through the roof of the church, and this book, ironically titled Defender of Peace, was one of the books hit. Now this example is a little different from, from what I've been discussing today, because the destruction of this book was not deliberate to this particular volume. We could perhaps call it collateral damage from the bombing. But of course a bomb is meant to destroy whatever it hits, whether people, property, buildings, or books. And of course the deliberate destruction of buildings and other structures is also part of cultural genocide. This is one of the famous monumental Buddhas in Bamiyan, Afghanistan, sculpted sometime between the 4th and 7th centuries. They were purposely bombed and dynamited by the Taliban in 2001, completely destroying them. Theoretically, because they were considered to be idols and therefore contrary to Islamic teachings. So you see this empty, and it, there, here's a, this is a person. This is to show you how huge these are. The words Dev Zor are well known to Armenians. For those who are not familiar with this place, I will explain its significance. During the years of the Armenian Genocide, which began in 1915, Armenians who were not slaughtered outright were gathered up and deported, and I put that word in quotation marks, to the Syrian desert. These so-called deportations were actually death marches. One of the destinations was Dev Zor, which you see on this map, in the middle of the Syrian desert. As stated by the historian Christopher Walker, and I quote, deportation was just a euphemism for mass murder. No provision was made for their journey or exile, and unless they could bribe their guards, they were forbidden, in almost all cases, food and water. If the people even managed to survive the marches, they ended up in these camps which were not really camps anyway, because there were no provisions for them. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians died there from exposure, starvation, disease, or were killed directly by the soldiers. Because of the tragic importance of this place to Armenians, they built a memorial there. And in 1990, the Armenian Genocide Martyrs Memorial Complex was completed in Dezor, which included a church museum and a memorial. They've also found a lot of bones in this region, and some of them have been placed in, in the church. In 2014, the site was destroyed by ISIS. These show before and after pictures. I should note that ISIS does not target only Christian sites. No, they are equal opportunity destroyers. They have also purposely demolished Muslim sites, including shrines and mosques if they decide that these sites are heretical to their own version of Islam. This is the manuscript we talked about in the beginning. When the lawyer Raphael Lemkin coined the term genocide, he defined not only the intent to destroy a group of people, but also included the deliberate aim of erasing their cultural legacy. We could call this cultural genocide, and we have seen just a few of many unfortunate examples this evening. Cultural artifacts are of vital importance to a people and are often considered to represent that people, their ideals, and their history. The destruction of these artifacts, therefore, constitutes a further attempt at annihilation. It is a way to try to destroy their soul. Some artifacts do survive and therefore reflect the stubborn survival of that group. I would like to close here with an opening of the Synaxarian at the Houghton Library that I showed you earlier, with um, 
which shows you here, I'm, what I'm showing here is the beginning of the Easter reading, a symbol of rebirth, renewal, and survival. Thank you. including the donor of my chair, um, yes, Mrs. Duffet, who is no longer with us. But uh, Chapet really brought the term of their, brought many Armenians to this area in the 90s. So for many, this is an important talk. But even if they're not from Chapet, <laughs> um, remembering the dead is a way of honoring things. It's also a way of celebrating survival, as Sylvie put it, because in our memory, those who are gone still have a place to live. And again, I've dedicated this to Sylvie's great-grandfather, but everyone here whether they're Armenian or from elsewhere, has lost people in tragic circumstances. And I would like to extend my thanks to the Armenian Club for helping me organize this since many years. And every year I ask them to come and join me up here for a moment of silence. So as they walk up, I will tell you what we're going to do next. So with the Armenian Club and those members that I've just seen that have come back, that used to be members of the Armenian Club, yes, that means you and that means you, Peter, would you please come and join me for a moment of silence? Now, uh, my dear friend Joyce Barsom has brought carnations that are at the back, and for those of you who'd like to commemorate, there is a plaque who was given by Mrs. Duffett to Tufts, right next to the chapel, right here behind this huge window. Please take a carnation after the moment of silence and go and put it on the plaque. If you wish not to do that, you can exit immediately through this door because it will take some time to go through the other. All of you are invited to a reception that follows in Balu Hall, it's right next door in the Coolidge room, it's the first building across the lawn. So please join us later, and if you have questions for Sylvie, save them for later. Now, would the Armenian Club join me? Or are you? Nairi, Peter, all of you. Good luck. My club. members from the Fletcher School also like to come up here. Come on. <laughs> I see you there. There's no reason to stay behind. such as remembering the day, this, that this be the joy of an old professor. <laughs> so, um, please, let's keep a moment of silence, after which we can speak again.
Thank you all for being with us tonight. Especially you, Sylvie, as Mom has talked. Thank you. <laughs>